Our next guest, something else you're gonna enjoy because she is no stranger at being the first to do something. That's Love right. It. Alejandra Campoverde, Haitian immigrant who as a child came to the United States from Mexico with her family. She's also a first generation college student graduating from that little known school, Harvard, oh. and also the University of Southern Gosh. California. Boom, boom, That's one, two, right. punch. Under the Obama administration, she became the first White House Deputy Director of Hispanic Media. Mm -hmm. Pause for dramatic effect. That's right. And now, Alejandra is detailing all of those experiences and more in her best-selling new memoir, First Gen. So without any further ado, she's joining us live now this morning. Alejandra, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. I know. So you, she's been on a whirlwind tour. First of all, felicidades on your memoir. Thank what? you. It just came out a couple weeks ago, so I, I'm in the thick of it right now. I know. You're, you're, in, you're moving and shaking. I wonder, I know what compelled you to share your story, but why now? Why not do this book 10 years ago? Well, 10 years ago, I hadn't really grown into the answers, right, that I was looking for. And I talk about in the book how the idea really crystallized for me a few years ago when I was speaking at Harvard's Latinx graduation. And I was looking around at the students, and I kind of recognized some of the mixed emotions that it seemed that they were having that I recognized in myself. And that was that, you know, we have this kind of glossy, linear uh, vision and, and story narrative we're told about the American dream and social mobility. But in my experience, there were a lot of emotional tolls to the experience of social mobility for those of us that are first generation. And in my book, I expand that. It's not just first generation Americans. It could be first generation your family to go to college, first generation to break out of a cycle of poverty, first generation to be a professional. But what we all have in common are these widespread emotional experiences that are complicated and complex, yeah. and a lot of times we don't talk about that. I love that. I, I, and I, I never even dawned on me until we were talking about this interview in our pre-show meeting. And in the book, you describe that as the trailblazer toll. Yeah. And as you mentioned, is essentially the emotional weight that, that comes with being the first to do something. Not what you did, but maybe what Marisol did, and, or, anybody. or anybody. So can you just elaborate or go into a little bit more depth with us about that concept? and some of the challenges that you face or that you, you've experienced that come with being first gen fill in the blank. Well, to your point, it was very important to me to name this because you can't heal from that which you don't name. And there are so many experiences that get a lot of attention like imposter syndrome that people kind of mm. point to as being the first gen experience. But there's many, many, many more you know, there is the breakaway guilt of being, you know, maybe right. one of the only people in your family that has certain experiences and, and coming home and realizing that your experience is the only one that's changed, right? And kind of yeah. navigating that guilt and pride within yourself. There's also, you know, parentification. I call it a, the parentified child. Mm. A lot of times children in immigrant families or, or children in families where they are kind of the first tend to take on like a caretaker role or a translator role or a form filler role or even just emotional support. And all of that has tentacles into our adult life. Amen. And so a lot of times since that hasn't been validated to us, it's kind of hard to unpack where all these different emotions come from when we reach these pinnacles, but we still feel very isolated in a lot of ways. So I wanted to name these things. And it's interesting because right now I'm speaking at schools all over the country and I keep hearing young people and not so young people mm -hmm. telling me, wow, I feel better just knowing what it is. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I want to thank you, Alejandra, for giving words to those feelings and experiences that you had, because I suppose at some point you felt singular in them. But you are speaking to me. You are speaking to my homegirls on Baychester Avenue, because many of us have been trailblazers. I've definitely I'm a trailblazer, I will brandish that proudly, but I also felt like an imposter for a lot of my life, where yeah. I felt like the dumb kid in the smart row. You know, why do I get to be here, but my best friend who maybe didn't get an A on her grades is not here with me. Imposter syndrome, yeah. many of us are not a stranger to it. We talk about it on this show. Can you talk to your experience of it? Um, did you experience imposter syndrome? How did you work through it? Is it something that you just put on a shelf and acknowledge, or does it come back and creep up ever? I did experience it, 
And in the book, I make a point of expanding our definition of it because I call it imposter syndrome plus because it's the confidence that we you know, want to feel and don't always feel, but it's also the ways that no matter how confident we are, that it's reflected back to us by the systems that we're in that we don't necessarily belong. Mm -hmm. So when I say in the book, sometimes I'd walk into the White House feeling so confident and I wouldn't walk out feeling as confident. Now, was that somehow that I had been overtaken by imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. Or was that that there's different cues that sometimes you respond to and nonverbal cues that make you feel like maybe you don't belong mm -hmm. or maybe you don't have as much to offer? But the interesting thing that you say is, you know, how isolating yet widespread it is. And, you know, I commissioned a poll when I wrote this book because, you know, some of these stories, were they're anecdotal, even though we know that they're not only anecdotal. But I wanted to be able to really look at some data. So we surveyed first generation students across the country and they said with no uncertain terms that 65 percent of them said that the first generation student experience was emotionally and took a negative toll on their emotional mm -hmm. and health. Right. Yep. And the reasons imposter syndrome was at the bottom. Number one was financial trauma. Mm. And number two was the isolation and loneliness. Right. Which is why I wrote this book. Because you can be a trailblazer, but trailblazing doesn't pay checks. Exactly. In, cer in certain circles. <laughs> yeah. Now, and like I say in the book, you can smash through glass ceilings, but many times you're left to clean up the shards on your own. Gosh. Now do you know why I want I her on the broadcast, I mean, this Alejandra. Is, I just want to sit back in. I want to go to one of her one of her uh, talks that she's doing around around the yeah. the world. The, I'm the coming country, back to books. New York next month, so Good. please, I would love that. We, we, would. The, we have a big studio here with this, right. many seats with your name on it. Yeah. But we we have to talk about you know we mentioned in the open that you under the Obama administration became the first White House Deputy Director of His Hispanic Media. I mean, I was, we, we were like, wait a minute. So this wasn't even a position. And then you came into everybody's line of sight and they were like, oh, well, we have to make a position right. for her because she is just, so uh, please well, talk to I, us about I'm that whole gonna, experience. I'm not going to say that it was, it was all motivated by me walking in, but you know, my team was the first team that had ever exclusively focused on the Latino community and communications. And that's a real testament to mm -hmm. the Obama White House, the Obama administration, to really understand that, you know, communication and messaging that is really culturally competent, culturally relevant yeah. to your community is important. You know, how we speak to people and who speaks to people, who tells our stories is important. And like I said, that's a real testament to a White House that acknowledged that we all deserve a seat at the table. And, and to further that point, Latinos across the land, anytime President Obama spoke, he would say, he wouldn't say Latinos, he'd say, and the Latino community, and then you would hear the sound of Latinos across the land be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but he got it, he got it, hence. Well, he, he had there. somebody smart. That's right, he had someone him. very smart working with him. <gasps> in addition to the memoir, you just started an organization that's a warning fellowship. Fellowships to first generation college students. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because it is, it is this idea that you get a modicum of success and you open doors mm -hmm. for people who are coming behind you, which we love the spirit of advocacy here. Well, as we know now, financial trauma is such a big part of this experience. And it's not just student loans. I mean, I try to keep it super real in this book and talk about, yeah, I went to Harvard, but I took out $150,000 worth of student loans to be able to do that. Right. And so let's talk about the spaces between these bullet points. Let's talk about not just the successes and the pinnacles, but the real stories, which is how we got there. That's where the truth lies. And so when I dug through this and, and talked to so many students, this visceral experience of, you know, beyond paying for books, also being able to pay for gas, being able to buy a blazer for an internship interview, it was real. It was a real weight. And one of the reasons why a third of college students right now are first gen, but 90% don't graduate on time. Wow, oh Think God. about that. Well, so I wanted to give out, personally fund these scholarships and their unrestricted grants. So these young people, these first gen students, they can have use access them and just use. have yeah. a normal life. Alejandra, it was a wonderful, thank you, thank wonderful you, thank you. time talking to you today. The memoir thank is you. called First Gen. It is out now and you can find it wherever you get your books. Go to her website. We'll also put on our website the link to her fellowship. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you.